Cal State University Channel Island, Professor Sean Anderson, Professor of Environmental Science. He's our guest today, and there's much more to the title than that. Can you grab that <laughs> microphone? And let's really uh, sincerely and seriously look at, one, the great program that you have at Cal State University Channel Islands, and then some of the dangerous news, but things, also some, some of the good things. things. But there's good stuff, too. Yeah, there's yeah. There's good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hate to start off with a fish die-off, but let's uh, just go <laughs> over the program very, very quickly. And what students would be in for if they decide to go to? Yeah, so channel. so um, we're the uh, most interdisciplinary program on our university campus, except for liberal studies, which doesn't count because they can kind of do anything. Um, but as far as the the majors that actually have uh, you know defined plans, we're really interdisciplinary. So our students have to take economics, political science, in addition to chemistry, biology, all that kind of stuff. We think t for them to solve the kind of challenges that we have right now requires them to be able to talk to people in politician talk, in economics talk, in regular folks talk, in addition to all the, the science and technical stuff. So they get all that, but, but they start with this grounding in all these different fields and these different disciplines. So, so we think, um, oh, so one of the things that we know that we're doing a good job is the fact that after our students graduate, a very, very high percentage of them get jobs immediately. And the neat thing is most of our students are getting jobs in Santa Barbara, Ventura, Northern LA County. So they're all, they're, you know, 99, not 99, about 95% of them are staying local, which is great. My previous university, big university, research university up in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, most folks left and most folks went into academia. Here, most of our folks are going into private sector, they're going to consulting firm, they're going to government sector, all that kind of good stuff, and they're, um, and they're staying local. Although we're doing so much with robots, um, more and more of my students are getting sucked up to Silicon Valley these days. But, mm. but it's an interdisciplinary approach to solve these interdisciplinary problems. And I love the fact that economics is put into it mm -hmm. too because it's such a huge part. Absolutely. If we do this, what's going to happen to our economy? Absolutely. And a lot of people, a lot of, uh, it would be maybe on the conspiracy side of saying they're after us because they want to destroy our, they want to remove our cars, they want to do all these terrible right. things. But right. when right. you come in economically, it, it brings up the electric car is a great example. The economics of that does it pencil for the average right. person making sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year, paying their mortgage? Can they afford one? It sounds neat, but does it pencil? Right. I mean, so for example, I have a, a Prius because I'm a nerd, and so uh, <laughs> so uh, love my Prius. And I actually, because I'm a nerd, I've written down every single. So I bought mine in 2004. Every single time I've gotten gas. I've written that down. So I actually know exactly how much money I spent, and it's insanely cheaper. You know, mm -hmm. tens of thousands, uh, many, many tens of thousands of dollars cheaper than had I bought a conventional car. And so we're interested in quantifying that kind of stuff, right? Because we're sensitive to folks. We're, we think everybody needs a healthy, kick butt place to live, not just the wealthy folks. Uh, the poor folks, the marginalized folks, everybody. And so the notion of, of um, sort of environmentalists as this sort of elitist or they don't care about us, that's, the, that's not my experience. So our, our students are uh, the, the daughters and sons of farm workers and fishermen and the guys that work for Caltrans and firefighters. So we, we're, we're not selecting from some rarefied subset of people that are sitting around doing sort of navel gazing that some people uh, think academics do. We really are in the thick of it with whether it's an oil spill stuff, whether it's an, a, a not sexy, boring, every day in and day out bureaucratic struggle, whatever it is, we're, we're really trying to give them the tools to make um, this place better. I know in the old days when I was at New Crowley's, anti New Crowley's, <laughs> uh, they, they would say it reeks of backpacking and granola. Right, and, 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 and something else did, too. Yeah. That's now legal. Yeah, that's, uh, well, Obviously. it is now. <laughs> we'll, we'll get some more data on that. Well, let's talk about a few of the things. Off air, we were uh, chatting about the fish kill mm -hmm. that happened mm -hmm. recently. Give us a little insight on that. Yeah, so the quick version is uh, the big story people have probably heard is off of Florida, all, this, all summer we've been having a lot of critters dying. Out there, what seems to be happening is um, some release of some, some um, fertilizers have caused some algal blooms, we call a harmful algal bloom, and the toxins from that algae are killing all these fish. Here in Southern California, we've had a, a, a large die-off at Ormond Beach and the waterways around Ormond Beach. And then um, just a few weeks ago, that was in uh, about a six, six, eight weeks ago, and then just about um, three, four weeks ago, uh, we had a huge fish kill that started in Malibu Lagoon. In both places, we've lost lots and lots of fish, um, all of which died very quickly and um, lead to all the problems that happen when fish dies. It's stinky, people don't want to come to the beach, people don't want to go to the lagoon, etc. 
Um, so far, we've done. Uh, we're in the midst of of trying to figure out what's been going on. <coughs> that that death is not being caused by pe pesticides, and not being caused by algal toxins. It seems to be being caused by just simply very very hot weather. Interesting. Now, the canary in the coal mine yeah. for a lot of people would be. Should I let my kid into this water right. if all these fish are right. dying? So, right. Now, I took a, a photo, and this is interesting that you're in here today. We yeah, were yeah. hiking above the beach, and there was that, see that milky yeah. color? Now, what is yeah. that? Me, the kid noticed it first, and it just sat there along the coast. We are between Malibu Rock and that dune that goes down to the beach. Right, right, right. right. So, um, the, so that picture is, we're looking down, and it's sort of dark water, and then right up hugging the beach is, is a lighter cast of water. So that is some different amount of um, most likely uh, a fresher water or some other stuff um, that is leading to um, a slightly different density of the water. So that water up near up near the uh, in, in, near the beach is floating on top. So that's not toxic. That's not okay. dangerous. Um, but it does tell us that there's not big currents. It's kind of like when there. we make a black and tan with a beer. That's right. Right. And so as soon as you start drinking the beer, yeah. it gets mixed up. So that's telling us there isn't much wind, right? So that's telling us okay. it's probably pretty hot that day. Mm -hmm. um, and so the water is a bit stagnant next to the coast. That's not necessarily bad. It's just is saying that we're not getting the normal mixing that we would otherwise get. Now, one of the issues, and we have Kevin Brand, and he's our local fishing guy. And he's talking about all the exotics they're pulling out yeah. now. That we're yeah. getting some yeah. really good yeah. fishing up here. So yeah. in one way it's like cool, in another way it's like not so cool. Sure. So so um, that's it's a co common phenomenon. Is um, our our water here in uh, Southern California typically uh, in, right up next to the coast? It's typically moving down southward, so towards LA, towards Mexico. When we have one of these El Nino events or these unusually warm water events, it switches a little bit, and we get the warm water coming up. When that comes up, we tend to get all kinds of cool um, fish that we don't, and, and invertebrates that we don't typically get here. And so that's been happening. But what's historically happened is that happens, boop, boop, during an El Nino, and then it goes away. And so it leaves a couple residents around. Now that warm water is coming up much more consistently. So we're having these critters that used to just be occasional visitors now become residents. So when I was, you know, just 20 years ago when I did my PhD, out here off the Southern California coast, we would occasionally get Humboldt squid, these big giant squid, occasionally. And they would come up and, and then they would disappear. Now we have resident populations of Humboldt squid in Monterey Bay. So the fishery, some of the fishery has switched to fishing these, not the uh, smaller market squid, but actually the big honking Humboldt squid. Mm. So that is a consequence of the warming water. So just a few weeks ago, um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which has the Scripps Pier, and has been caught every day, um, every day, every night, you know, day in, day out, has been measuring the surface temperature of the ocean and other properties of the ocean. So this summer they recorded 78.6 degree uh, surface water sea temperature, the hottest they've ever recorded in 102 years. So that warmness, that, that this broad consistent warmness may well be what's causing these fish to be, these freaky fish to show up and uh, essentially the same phenomenon, what's at the heart of why we're seeing some of these recent fish kills. So all this stuff is related, it, it seems to be. Now, when something like this happens within the classroom, do you mm -hmm. add lib and yes. become a lab yes. and send the I, I do. I do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, this is what it's all about. That's this right. This is the perfect thing. Rather than saying, well, this is happening over there. We're going to study. But you, you can go straight to an event that's occurring and the yeah. kids get hands-on. That's great. Yeah, and so one, one of the things that's neat about a new program and sort of interdisciplinary program um, is that we have the flexibility to do that. So we don't have this huge bureaucracy that's been in existence for 100 years that says this is how we do stuff. We grab them. We go out. We, we grab the oil. I mean, so, for example, with the refugio oil spill, the they, um, Plains All-American was just convicted on Friday. Um, when that oil spill happened, well, that, that wasn't my classroom kids, that was my, my research students, but we, we grabbed them, boom, we're out, and we were the first one, one of the first groups on scene um, sampling, getting, the, and especially in something like a wildfire, like the Thomas Fire, which our students were helping out with as well, something like an oil spill, wildfire, natural disaster, time is super critical. And so um, I, we don't put our students in any dangerous conditions or anything like that, but, but if you don't go out really quick and get that burned critter, get that piece of soil, whatever it is, um, you're going to lose it. And so these students are, are really oftentimes first responders in terms of figuring out what happened. That's pretty amazing. Now, one of the other things, we we got to jump really quick here. Love talking to you about this stuff, though. I was up in Alaska, and they were talking about how the trees were dying, mm -hmm. and they were staying mm -hmm. in these forests. 
the temperatures weren't getting really cold and mm -hmm. the beetles yes, that exist exactly. yep. don't go dormant right. and they keep eating and they kill the trees off. So, so that, that's not, think, that's why not, does it matter that it gets cold? Right. Well, it matters a lot. That's not an Alaska thing. That's the entire western U.S. So we, the bark beetle that you're talking about typically went through one cycle, so one generation of, of insects over the course of a typical year. Now in most places we get at least two generations, in some places we're getting three generations. So the populations are going just, there's a technical term for it, which is, no, is ape something, ape something, mm -hmm. which I won't say on the radio, but, but, but it, it, it's crazy, right? I mean, so, mm -hmm. so this is one of the many phenomenon that is driving these dead forests, which then in turn drives these huge fires, and then in turn has these huge economic impacts, and on and on and on. So again, the climate change is being felt in all these different ways. And it'll create a new environment because once they go out, what is going to be the growth that comes Absolutely. So, so a paper I was just reading this weekend was, what do we call a non-native invasive species when all of these ecosystems are in flux? When everything is changing, what is quote-unquote natural, what is quote-unquote artificial? So we're making this, so we're essentially doing a big experiment to our one lifeboat of planet Earth, and that is, that is of concern. That should be of concern to us. Professor Sean Anderson in studio, Professor of Environmental Science, Cal State University, Channel Islands. More coming up on KVTA. So with uh, uh, Professor Sean Anderson in here, we're going to talk a little oil spill coming up too. It's yep. the uh, anniversary of the 19th Coming up to the 50th anniversary. Yeah, yep. coming up to that in January. So we'll have you in again. Thank you so much. It's great, Kim. Uh, what's happening at the campus? Well, this is our big concert. It's the President's Dinner in Concert. Um, on October 13th, and this year it's going to be at the Commemorative Air Force Museum in Camarillo. 